I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, who I'm very proud and honored to introduce, Professor Stephen Zunis, who comes from University of San Francisco and who did a great job in organizing and pulling it together to get here uh, in the last minute. As Roe pointed out, uh, we're getting better at planning, but we still need to plan far more ahead. Uh, Professor Zunis, uh, we'll speak on the power of nonviolent action in conflict zones. At University of San Francisco, he headed the Peace and Justice Studies Department and the Middle East Studies. He founded the Middle East Studies Department at University of San Francisco. He's one of the leading scholars in the U.S. on Middle East policy and strategic planning, strategic nonviolence. He's associate editor of the Peace Review and a contributing editor to Tikkun. He's written several books, published hundreds of articles, frequently visits Israel, and is on the board of several peace organizations. Professor Stephen Zunas. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, Despite a number of, of trips uh, to, to Israel, this is my uh, first time um, here at, uh, at Neva Shalom Wal HaSalam. And, um, but I have heard about uh, uh, the great work that has uh, been uh, going on here for many decades now, as well as the, the very good work of uh, many of the organizations uh, that uh, you represent here. Um, I want to start by observing that while the world is no less conflict-ridden uh, than it has been in the past, recent decades have witnessed a remarkable shift in many areas regarding how conflict is waged. In many places, either armed struggle or acquiescence to violence and injustice were once seen as the only alternatives. Yet now strategic nonviolent action has proven to be remarkably effective, even in cases against repressive dictatorships, minority rule, and foreign occupation, and even in the midst of war zones. It was not the leftist guerrillas of the New People's Army that brought down the US-backed Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines. It was nuns praying the rosary in front of the regime's tanks and millions of others who brought Greater Manila to a standstill. It was not the 11 weeks of bombing that brought down Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic, the infamous butcher of the Balkans. It was a nonviolent resistance movement led by young students whose generation had been sacrificed in a series of bloody military campaigns against neighboring Yugoslav republics who were able to mobilize a large cross-section of the population to rise up against a stolen election. It was not the armed wing of the African National Congress that brought majority rule to South Africa. It was workers, students, and township dwellers who, through a series of strikes, boycotts, the creation of alternative institutions, and other acts of defiance, made it impossible for the apartheid regime to continue. It was not NATO that brought down the communist regimes of Eastern Europe or freed the Baltic republics from Soviet control. It was Polish dock workers, East German church people, Estonian folk singers, Czech intellectuals, and millions of ordinary citizens. Similarly, such tyrants as Jean-Claude de Valier in Haiti Augusto Pinochet in Chile, King Ganendra in Nepal, General Suharto in Indonesia, Zine Abedin Ben Ali of Tunisia, and other dictators from Bolivia to Benin, from Madagascar to the Maldives, were forced to step down when it became clear that they were powerless in the face of massive nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation. History has shown that, in most cases, non strategic nonviolent action can be more effective than armed struggle. 
a recent uh, study from Freedom House demonstrated how of the nearly 70 countries that have made the transition from dictatorship to varying degrees of democracy during the past four decades, only a small minority did so through armed struggle from below or reform instigated from above. And hardly any new democracies resulted from foreign invasion. In nearly three quarters of these transitions, change was rooted in democratic civil society organizations that employed nonviolent methods. Similarly, in the highly acclaimed book, Why Civil Resistance Works, authors Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stephan, who are decidedly mainstream, quantitative uh, oriented strategic analysts, noted how of the nearly 350 major insurrections in support of self-determination and democratic rule over the past century, primarily violent resistance was successful only 26% of the time, whereas primarily nonviolent campaigns had a 53% chance of success, more than twice as likely to succeed. Similarly, they have noted that successful armed struggles take an average of eight years, while successful unarmed struggles take an average of only two years. Nonviolent action has also been a powerful tool in reversing coup d'etats. In Germany in 1923, in Bolivia in 1979, in Argentina in 1986, in Russia in 1991, in Burkina Faso in 2015, and nearly a dozen other cases, coups have been reversed when the plotters realized that after people took to the streets, physically controlling key buildings and institutions did not mean that they actually had seized power. Now, it's important to realize that in any liberation struggle, people will unfortunately be killed when challenging oppressive regimes. Still, nonviolent struggles generally result in far fewer casualties than armed struggles. Soldiers and police are far less likely to shoot into crowds of unarmed demonstrators than to shoot at people shooting at them. And they are far more likely to defect. Over 5,000 people were killed by the Syrian regime in the initial nine months of the uprising when it was largely nonviolent. And defections and security forces were widespread. Since the struggle became mostly violent, defections from government forces plummeted, nearly 50 times more civilians have died, and nearly half of that country's population have become refugees and other displaced persons. Similarly, while nearly 300 people were killed during the initial nonviolent phase of the Libyan uprising against Gaddafi, as many as 30,000 people died in the course of the six months of armed struggle that followed. Now, not all nonviolent pro-democracy movements have been successful, of course. In addition to Syria, nonviolent struggles have been successfully repressed in China, Iran, Bahrain, and elsewhere. It is important to remember, however, that nonviolent struggle, like armed struggle, will only succeed if the resistance uses appropriate strategies and tactics. A guerrilla army cannot expect instant success through a frontal assault on the capital. They know they need to initially build cadre and engage in small, low-risk operations, such as hit-and-run attacks. They need to be able to seek sanctuary and take the time to mobilize their base in peripheral areas before they have a chance of defeating the well-armed military forces of the state. Similarly, it may not make sense for a nonviolent movement to rely primarily on the tactic of massive street demonstrations in the early phase of the movement, but diversify their tactics understand their strengths and weaknesses, analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the regime, and act accordingly. 
Such a movement may need to initially focus on small decentralized actions or low-risk activities which invite widespread participation, like strikes and boycotts. There are hundreds of different methods of nonviolent resistance. If someone says, we tried nonviolence and it didn't work, one needs to ask what kinds of nonviolent strategies were employed, what kind of sequencing of tactics were developed, how long under what circumstances did they take place. Neither violence nor nonviolence works, <laughs> while on average primarily nonviolent struggles are more effective than primarily violent ones. Both depend on good strategic thinking and its effective implementation. Advances in military technology have given the state and other status quo powers an increasing advantage in, in, in recent years. Even when an armed insurgency or armed intervention is successful, large segments of the population are displaced, farms and villages are destroyed, cities and much of the nation's infrastructure are severely damaged, the economy is wrecked, and there is widespread environmental devastation. I visited Vietnam for the first time a few years ago, and you can still see the bomb craters, the hillsides denuded of vegetation from the defoliants, and the large number of people in wheelchairs. We have to wonder if the benefits of waging an armed insurrection even when victorious, are worth the consequences. Another disadvantage of military means is the tendency, once in power, for successful armed movements against dictatorships to fail in establishing pluralistic, democratic, and independent political systems capable of supporting the social and economic development needs of the people, including demilitarization and human rights. Indeed, armed struggles often promote the ethos of a secret elite vanguard, a strict hierarchy of command and control, and the message that power comes from the barrel of a gun, resulting in little tolerance for dissent. By contrast, Successful nonviolent movements require the building of broad coalitions of, of, of disparate elements of civil society, more open to the give and take and to compromise, providing a model of political pluralism which can serve as the basis of a democratic society that respects human rights. In some countries, like Algeria and Guinea-Bissau, the more progressive elements of the revolutionary leadership fell victim to military coups not long after the armed movements ousted European colonialists, and the new government abandoned many of their progressive ideals and slid into authoritarianism. Other victorious anti-imperialist struggles like those in Angola and Mozambique fell into bloody civil wars. In Eritrea, an armed revolution which once inspired many of us, we now see the victorious EPLF ruling one of the world's most militarized and totalitarian states. By contrast, despite some notable exceptions, like Iran and Egypt, which slid back into dictatorship not long after revolutions ousted autocratic leaders, history has shown that most dictatorships overthrown by primarily nonviolent means have become stable democracies within a few years. By contrast, the vast majority of dictatorships overthrown through armed struggle have become new dictatorships and or plunged into chaos with ongoing rivalries between battles between rival armed groups and increased militarization. While Tunisia whose dictatorship was overthrown in an unarmed insurrection, has made real, if uneven, progress towards democracy. In neighboring Libya, whose dictatorship 
was overthrown in a NATO-backed armed struggle. It finds itself in a state of ongoing chaos and civil war, including extremist groups controlling large parts of the country. And of course, we continue to see the tragic results of the US-led military overthrow of Iraqi dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. Now, as someone who lives in a modern democratic state, I cannot pass moral judgment against people who feel the need to take up arms. But I have long cautioned people in the West not to romanticize armed struggle. Our homes will never be subjected to drone attacks or other forms of counterinsurgency warfare. I remember during my student activism in the anti-apartheid movement while in university in the 1970s, the debate was dominated between those in my university administration who argued that the best way to end apartheid was through the supposedly benign influence of foreign capital. And then on the other hand, these born again student Marxists who uh, insisted that it could only come through the, victor through the armed wing of the ANC marching into Pretoria in a bloody armed revolution. Neither side recognized the realities of South Africa itself and that the key to bringing down apartheid was massive non-cooperation and unarmed resistance combined with the international solidarity efforts to impose targeted sanctions against the white minority regime. But one thing I need to emphasize <laughs> that is even more important. I have helped lead workshops and seminars on strategic nonviolent action in five continents, arguing that unarmed civil resistance is the most effective means of advancing democracy and social justice. Though I have generally been well received, it places me in an awkward situation as an American given that the U.S. government provides more military, diplomatic, and economic support for autocratic regimes and occupation armies than any government in the world. This is why I put at least as much time in my research and my advocacy challenging U.S. foreign policy as I do of the question of strategic nonviolent action. As I tell my American audiences, if you care about human rights, uh, democracy overseas, you must be willing to work for a change in US policy. Indeed, I would argue that the country that most needs a large scale nonviolent resistance in support of human rights and democracy is the United States. <laughs> My advocacy of nonviolent action is not rooted in pacifism. While I greatly respect those who have religious or moral obligation to violence, objection to violence, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, I am speaking as a political scientist and a strategic analyst. The nonviolence I'm talking about is a means of waging struggle, not a personal philosophy. While questions regarding the morality of the utilization of armed struggle as compared with the utilization of nonviolent methods are indeed important. What I am primarily interested in is what works. <clears throat> Though the uh, efficacy of nonviolent resistance against state actors has become increasingly appreciated, what about non-state actors? Particularly in situations where the conflict is dominated by competing armed groups, warlords, terrorists, and those who don't care about popular support or international reputation. But even in these cases, which social scientists call fragmented tyrannies, we have seen some remarkable successes, such as in war-torn Liberia and Sierra Leone, where, a primary, right, where primarily women-led nonviolent movements played a major role in bringing peace to these countries by forcing the warlords despite their blood diamonds and utilization of child soldiers and mass atrocities to make peace and allow for a restoration of democracy. In, in rural Colombia, suffering from decades of civil war in which its citizens were threatened by armed forces of the government, leftist guerrillas, right-wing paramilitaries, and drug kingpins, 
towns and villages successfully established themselves as peace communities, declaring a strict neutrality in the conflict and a refusal to bear arms or provide logistical support for any armed group while administering their autonomous municipalities through nonviolent conflict resolution and participatory democracy. In the Niger Delta of Nigeria, beset with environmental disasters, government repression, criminal gangs, and armed vigilantes working for oil companies, we have seen mass demonstrations, occupation of oil platforms, and other nonviolent resistance efforts, largely led by women, supplemented by an international boycott of the oil companies most liable. We have seen remarkable examples of nonviolent resistance in even the most war-torn areas of the Middle East. In Yemen, while simultaneously opposing the terror bombing of their country by the Saudis, hundreds of thousands of Yemenis have nonviolently defended their universities, businesses, neighborhoods, and even entire cities from control by armed Houthi rebels. Protests have even successfully challenged Al-Qaeda's totalitarian rule in parts of that country. Similarly, in Syria, there are still ongoing acts of nonviolent resistance, not just against the Assad regime, but also against hardline Islamists who have taken control in parts of Idlib and other areas of the country, limiting their ability to impose their reactionary agenda. During the counterinsurgency war in Iraq, residents of Ramadi engaged in a general strike that sh totally shut down the Iraqi city in protests of the U.S. military siege, assaults on civilian neighborhoods, and random arrest of thousands of young men by American occupation forces, resulting in the Americans modifying their tactics. And the recent successes in driving Daesh from Syrian and Iraqi cities came not just from bombing campaigns, which also killed thousands of innocent civilians, but by widespread non-cooperation by those under their rule. Not only did the majority of the population of these cities manage to flee, despite threats of death to those trying to escape, thereby denying uh, the cult the tax revenues and a workforce, but 80% of those remained refused to send their children to Daesh-run schools to be indoctrinated. Now, the question that is perhaps most on the minds of, uh, 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 of you folks is whether nonviolent action can work against a military occupation. I acknowledge that nonviolent resistance to occupation is particularly challenging more so than struggling against one's own dictator. One of the factors that has made unarmed civil resistance movement effective have been in the reluctance of soldiers to fire into crowds of unarmed people, some of whom may be friends, neighbors, or even family members, and in any case, are recognized as compatriots, people with whom they can identify. When those you, with those whom you are ordered to suppress are people you have been taught to see as somehow less than human because of their ethnicity, nationality, religion, language, or culture, you are far more likely to rationalize to yourself about the legitimacy of engaging in brutal repression. Similarly, despite activists employing nonviolent tactics and simply demanding an end to occupation, if you have been convinced that they really would like to kill you and your family and destroy your country if given a chance, you would also be more willing to use violence against them. At the same time, there have been a number of cases which show promise of the power of strategic nonviolent action by subjugated peoples against foreign belligerent occupation. It took a full six months for Soviet occupation troops to consolidate their control of Czechoslovakia following the 1968 invasion of that country. And the resistance paved the way for the communist regime's overthrow two decades later. Nonviolent resistance in the occupied Western Sahara has forced Morocco to offer an autonomy proposal, which, while fall, still falling well short of their obligations to grant the Sahrawis their right of self-determination, at least acknowledges that the territory is not simply another part of Morocco. <clears throat> 
ongoing acts of resistance to the German occupation of Denmark and Norway during World War II not only saved the lives of the majority of the Jews in those countries, but the Nazis were never able to completely control the population, particularly in the final years. Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia freed themselves from Soviet occupation through nonviolent resistance prior to the USSR's collapse. In Lebanon, a nation ravaged by war for decades, 30 years of Syrian domination was ended through a large-scale nonviolent uprising in 2005. In Ukraine, Mariupol became the largest city to be liberated from control by Russian-backed rebels, not by bombings and artillery strikes by the Ukrainian military, but when thousands of unarmed steelworkers marched peacefully into occupied sections of the downtown and drove out the armed separatists. The first Palestinian Intifada in the 1980s, despite the iconic image of the stone-throwing youth and the murders of suspected collaborators, the bulk of the Intifada was nonviolent, with such tactics as peaceful demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, tax refusal, occupations, blockades, and the creation of alternative institutions. The unified national leadership command of the uprising emerged to coordinate the resistance, which sent out directives for a variety of resistance activities, 92% of which were explicitly nonviolent. Uh, interestingly, the exiled PLO uh, military leader Abu Jihad soon recognized the power of the largely nonviolent movement and was a key figure in convincing Arafat and others to support the resistance. It's probably not coincidental that this was when the Israeli government decided to assassinate him, not back when he was directing terrorist operations. Thousands of Palestinians working for Israel in the occupied territories resigned. Popular committees, many headed by women, took on a series of responsibilities supporting the population suffering from increasingly restrictive curfews and limits on movement. When the Israeli government ordered the closure of Palestinian schools, kindergartens through university, an underground education network emerged despite threats of up to 10 years imprisonment for, for teachers taking part. Indeed, Palestinians found taking part in these popular committees was subjected to worse punishment by Israeli occupation authorities than those engaged in acts of resistance, a sign of what the Israeli government saw as a bigger threat. The popular empowerment of the Palestinians during this period, in which much of the subjugated population effectively became self-governing entities through massive non-cooperation and the creation of all alternative, alternative institutions, was, was quite impressive because this not only challenged the Israeli occupiers, but the conservative pro-Jordanian elite, which had dominated West Bank politics for generations. More critically, it moved the locus of the Palestinian resistance from the exiled PLO to Palestinian civil society inside the occupied territories. Incidents of lethal violence against Israelis during the first intifada were relatively rare. During the four years of the uprising, only 12 Israeli soldiers were killed by Palestinians, while over 700 Palestinians were killed by Israeli occupation forces. Unfortunately, the combination of factionalism, interference by the PLO, increased Israeli repression, and unwavering U.S. support for the Israeli government led to the decline of the movement by the beginning of the 1990s. However, the struggle for national self-determination for the Palestinians, after little progress during years of armed struggle against Israel, made significant gains during this period as a result of the shift towards largely nonviolent methods during the uprising. Indeed, the PLO, while having de-emphasized the armed struggle for a number of years, finally formally renounced it. In addition, within its first year, the Intifada forced Jordan to give up its claim on the West Bank and to endorse Palestinian self-determination to an unprecedented degree. It led a discernible shift among public opinion 
in the United States and other Western countries away from the overwhelmingly positive, even naively romantic uh, view of Israel to one which also recognized the negative consequences of Israel ruling over another people. It led to unprecedented degree of dissent within Israeli society, including growing numbers of Israeli soldiers who refused to serve in the occupied territories. The Intifada exerted substantial influence on popular opinion throughout the Arab world to force some unresponsive regimes to once again take the Palestinian question more seriously. And it led the PLO to take the political initiative, including a declaration of independence in December 1988, and eventually led to the long overdue recognition of the PLO as a negotiating partner by Israel and the United States. The Israelis found themselves, through the nonviolent resistance, faced with the most intractable opposition ever. Furthermore, the non-cooperation with the occupation authorities initially led to an unprecedented degree of cooperation between the Palestinian population and the occupied territories, those living as citizens in Israel, and those in the Palestinian diaspora. It was hoped that the power of such tactics would eventually force an end to the Israeli occupation, not by driving Israeli forces out physically, but making Palestinian society ungovernable by anyone but the Palestinians themselves. Indeed, it was this recognition which led the Israeli concessions obtained in the September 1993 Principles of Understanding, which allowed Palestinian self-governance in most urban areas of the occupied territories. Now, it's perhaps significant that as the main arena shifted from popular nonviolent resistance to US-led diplomacy, which generally favored the occupying power, that the optimism for Palestinian statehood has faded. Combined with Israeli repression, Palestinian terrorism, Israeli attacks on civilian population centers, a series of right-wing Israeli governments unwilling to make the necessary compromises for peace, misrule by a corrupt and inept semi-authoritarian Palestine Authority, the rise of Hamas, and other factors the effect of the nonviolent resistance has been compromised. Despite this, the nonviolent struggle has continued, most notably in challenging Israeli efforts to annex parts of the West Bank through the building of a separation barrier deep inside the territory. Unfortunately, sustained nonviolent resistance is difficult in a situation in which Israeli occupation forces effectively surround the Palestinian population but do not exercise direct authority and where a government wants to rule over the land, but does not want the people. It is also made more difficult when the most powerful country in the world insists on being the chief mediator, uh, mediator of the conflict while simultaneously serving as the primary military, economic, and diplomatic supporter of the occupying power, blocking the United Nations from taking its customary role as an arbiter in international disputes and siding with the more hardline, nationalistic, expansionist, and chauvinistic political forces in Israel against those Israelis advocating peace, justice, and reconciliation. Well, the specifics differed in a number of important respects. The people of Indonesian occupied East Timor and South African occupied Namibia also faced enormous odds. As with the Palestinians, Neither diplomatic efforts nor the armed or nonviolent wings of their independent struggles were able to win self determination on their own. The shift came when global civil society was mobilized to challenge the occupying powers and pressure Western governments and Western corporations to end their tacit support for the occupations. Indeed, International solidarity campaigns employing nonviolent action played a critical role in ending these occupations by threatening the profits of complicit corporations and effectively shaming Western governments that continued to back the occupying powers. So, international solidarity is very important for nonviolent movements against foreign occupation 
facing such enormous odds. And it has to be more than just sending an occasional check to the New Israel Fund or other entities which support those with a more progressive vision of the future in this shared homeland. More importantly, just as nonviolent resistance within a nation needs to be strategically smart to win, so much so should solidarity efforts by global civil society. Most Palestinians now recognize that terrorism, in addition to being flagrantly illegal and morally reprehensible, was politically counterproductive. There is also an awareness that an organized armed struggle against Israeli occupation forces, while more legitimate, would be utterly futile and lead to additional suffering on a massive scale. At the same time, any realistic hope for a diplomatic solution has been undermined by the refusal by the US government to apply any tangible pressure on a series of right-wing Israeli governments to make the necessary compromises for peace and the U.S. preventing the United Nations from enforcing its resolutions, demanding Israel withdraw from its illegal settlements, rescind its annexation of Greater East Jerusalem, end the occupation and ongoing violations of international humanitarian law, and allow for the establishment of a viable independent Palestinian state alongside Israel. This is why 13 years ago, recognizing that mobilizing global civil society might provide the most reasonable means of ending their suffering and making peace and justice possible, 170 Palestinian trade unions, political parties, women's organizations, professional associations, popular resistance communities, uh, refugee networks, and others called for an international campaign of boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. The campaign in support of BDS has grown dramatically worldwide, yet has shown little in the way of tangible benefits for the Palestinians. Furthermore, it has in many ways increased the already high levels of political polarization regarding Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and in many cases, allowed for the debate over BDS to overshadow the debate over the occupation itself. BDS as a tactic is not new. There was also the large-scale BDS campaign in the 1970s and 1980s against South Africa, demanding that the country end its apartheid system and allow for majority rule. Other BDS campaigns in recent decades have targeted Burma, Sudan, and other countries with notorious human rights records. In Europe and elsewhere, there is a small but growing BDS campaign against the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. However, the BDS campaign targeting Israel has resulted in unprecedented controversy. Part of the reason is that it targets the world's only Jewish state, raising questions as to why Israel is being singled out. There are some valid responses to this. You know, while there are a large number of other governments, including many in the Middle East, which engage in even worse human rights abuses, there's a much stronger legal case for international mobilization against human rights abuses in territories recognized as being under foreign belligerent occupation, including legal restrictions on foreign companies unfairly profiting from violations of international humanitarian law. There are also clear international prohibitions against occupying powers, transferring civilian settlers onto lands seized by military force, and by extension, supporting such colonization efforts economically. Similarly, there are a host of legal issues regarding the export of weapons and other military resources to country that utilize them in suppressing the rights of those under occupation particularly when the use of such weapons results in large-scale civilian casualties. Uh, in no other country has there been such a widespread call by civil society uh, for the utilization of, of, of BDS. They note how 
Israel gets far more U.S. aid than any other country. The United States has used its veto power in the United Nations on scores of occasions to protect Israel from international accountability, and many U.S. officials rationalized for human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law committed by Israel that they would condemn if committed by most other countries. Using BDS to challenge Israeli policies is one way of attempting to redress the ways in which Israel is already being singled out by the U.S. government for support. However, even among critics of the Israeli occupation and of Israeli discrimination against Arab citizens of Israel, there are still concerns about the BDS campaign targeting Israel. As with previous Third World Solidarity movements in the West, some of the most vocal advocates can take rather hard-line positions, including in some extreme cases uh, overt anti-Semitism. In addition, the fact that historically boycotts of Jewish businesses have long been part of anti-Semitic campaigns, including Germany immediately preceding the Holocaust, calls for boycotting Israel and companies investing in Israel and even just the occupied territories can quite understandably bring up fears and suspicions among Jews, both in Israel and the diaspora. Another problem among some observers is that the formal BDS call fails to distinguish between Israel and the occupied territories and explicitly calls for the right of return for Palestinian refugees and their descendants, which would leave Jews as a minority in Israel and end its unique role as a Jewish state. Even among many who believe that Israeli colonization of the West Bank has reached a point where a viable two-state solution is no longer possible, and some sort of, of one-state solution, either by binational state or some other way of guaranteeing uh, collective rights, uh, that should be the goal, the failure to make this important legal distinction between Israel within its internationally recognized borders and territories under foreign belligerent occupation may be a tactical mistake. Focusing on the stronger moral and legal case against Israel's ongoing occupation of Palestinian lands seized in the 1967 war, illegal colonization of occupied territory, siege of the Gaza Strip, and denial of the Palestinians' right to self-determination, positions which have much greater popular support than the calling for the effective dissolution of Israel, would seem to be more effective. Uh, the BDS campaign, indeed, I believe, would be more effective if it focused on issues of human rights, international law, and self-determination, instead of being distracted by divisive arguments regarding Israel's right to exist or the nature of Zionism. So, and it's noteworthy that among the few major successes of the BDS campaign has been getting some major religious denominations and pension plans to divest from companies supporting the occupation and settlements and forcing some companies, such as SodaStream, to end their operations in legal, illegal settlements. By contrast, no companies have withdrawn from Israel itself and a number of entities which have divested from companies supporting the occupation have explicitly noted they are not advocating a total boycott of Israel. Similarly, a number of prominent individuals who have pledged to support the academic and cultural boycott have stressed that they will do so until Israel ends its occupation and is not contingent on granting the wholesale right of return for Palestinian refugees and their descendants. Ironically, the Israeli government, the U.S. government, and many state governments in the United States also fail to distinguish between Israel and the Israeli-occupied territories when it comes to BDS. Um, the, and a number of states which have passed laws forbidding state contracts with companies and other entities which boycott Israel, as well as in the major anti-BDS bill currently before Congress, Israel is legally defined to include territories controlled by Israel, thereby targeting even those who support boycotts and divestment only in regard to the occupation and settlements 
not Israel itself. Since there are currently no U.S. companies which boycott Israel, and it is already illegal under U.S. law to boycott Israel, these bipartisan legislative initiatives are not pro-Israel bills, but pro-occupation and pro-settlement bills. In the bill currently before Congress, which appears likely to be passed, any company that refuses for political reasons to trade or invest in an Israeli settlement in the West Bank would be subjected to major fines, even if they invested in Israel itself, sold its products in Israel, and purchased goods from entities inside the Green Line. In short, in addition to opposing Palestinian arms struggle, any role by the United Nations or international legal entities, any diplomatic pressure on the government to compromise, the Trump administration and a large majority of state and federal officials in the United States also appear to determine to suppress nonviolent resistance to the occupation as well, even the most limited forms of BDS. Both parties have made clear that the Palestinians' only recourse is engaging in direct negotiations with the Netanyahu government under the auspices of the Trump administration, which, needless to say, will bring them no closer to ending the occupation and colonization of what remains of Palestine. Despite all this, recent history, as I have stressed at the outset, has demonstrated the power of strategic nonviolent action against seemingly unsurmountable odds. As a result, I still believe it can make a difference, even here. I wish I could provide you with a blueprint of how to do it. I don't have one, and even if I did, you know the situation here much better than I do, and I would have no right to push for it. However, I would like to close with a couple of general observations, which would apply both to those of you who believe the establishment of a viable independent Palestinian state alongside a secure Israel is still a possibility, as well as to those of you who believe you know, that a, 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 some kind of binational state or other you know, one state you know, solution which guarantees both individual and collective rights uh, uh, at this point may be the necessary goal. And these observations would certainly also apply to those of you who are simply focusing primarily on the rights of Arab citizens of Israel. The theme of this conference is beyond dialogue. Dialogue is indeed important. Jews and Arabs need to hear each other's stories, learn from each other's history, understand how and why each other sees things the way they do, more fully appreciate each other's unique individuality as well as their common humanity, and commit to nonviolence. However, it is also critical to acknowledge the gross asymmetry in power at this stage in history between Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, and recognize that true reconciliation is not possible with the absence of justice. There is no contradiction between the use of nonviolent methods of waging conflict and nonviolent conflict resolution. Indeed, often the former is necessary to achieve the latter. In addition, just as an armed struggle and electoral campaign cannot be won without study, preparation, and a good strategy, the same is true with nonviolent movements. Even while recognizing the unique aspects of the struggle here in Israel and Palestine, there is much that can be learned from other civil resistance campaigns and nonviolent movements from around the world, as well as insights and analysis gained from scholarly research of these struggles. We no longer have to rely simply on Gandhi or King, as inspirational as they may be. And while those of us interested in strategic nonviolent action owe a great intellectual debt to the late Gene Sharp, there are now scores of scholarly works and manuals which have greatly expanded on his work which may be even more useful in better understanding 
how nonviolent movements can make a difference in the particularly challenging situation with which you are faced. Consider checking out the online resources provided by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict to get some ideas of the plethora of uh, resources available. Um, this was most of my draft speech, but I, I prepared a, a couple days ago, but the folks here asked me to add a few more specifics involving Israel and Palestine, which I threw together this morning. So let me go to that, and I'll go back, and I'll return to my concluding remarks. <clears throat> to wage an effective nonviolent campaign, it is helpful to have a clear long-term goal. And this has become more difficult, you know, since uh, you know, those of us who have struggled for many decades for an end of the occupation, which allow for the creation of a workable two-state solution through the creation of a Palestinian, viable Palestinian state in the occupied territories with you know, security guarantees for Israel, withdrawal of Israeli occupation forces and settlers with equitable land swaps necessary in a shared co-capital Jerusalem. You, you, know the, you know what we're talking about, of course. But there are increasing numbers of people who are now considering the likelihood that the democratic demographics of dramatically expanded settlements, the right-wing Israeli government's opposition to such a peace plan, and the U.S. government's support for Israeli policy may have made that goal out of reach and uh, by national state or some other kind of one-state solution which guarantees collective as well as individual rights may be the only realistic hope. But regardless of one's opinion on this question, I believe there is still an important legal distinction between Israel within its internationally recognized borders and territories recognized by the international community as being under foreign belligerent occupation. This is an still an important distinction because if it's not too late for a viable two-state solution, an anti-occupation civil resistance campaign is necessary to make it happen. If it is too late, an anti-occupation civil resistance campaign will make it clear to Israelis in the world that it is the Israeli government, not the Palestinians, who have made it impossible. Even putting this difficult question aside, it is absolutely critical to challenge the sense of normalcy by many Israeli Jews. The ongoing injustice of the occupation and the colonization of East Jerusalem and the West Bank, the inhumane siege of the Gaza Strip, and the denial of equal rights for Arab citizens of Israel is not only morally wrong, but threatens the long-term security of Israeli Jews as well. When I was born in the southern United States in the 1950s, segregation and discrimination against African Americans was accepted as normal. Martin Luther King and other supporters of civil rights for African Americans came to the realization that the most effective means to achieve racial justice was to challenge this sense of normalcy by engaging in a campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience. At that time, there were many liberal white Americans who opposed segregation and sincerely believed racism was wrong, yet opposed the use of nonviolent action. They argued that since the United States was a democracy, black Americans and their allies should work through the system, and that breaking even unjust laws would create disharmony and discord, resulting in violence. King argued, however, that there was not only already ongoing violence by white authorities and vigilantes against African Americans, that would routinely go unpunished. But the structural violence of segregation and discrimination was even worse. And that the political and legal system in the South at that time 
was incapable of making the necessary pressure changes without pressure from below. King recognized that nonviolent resistance would provoke a creative tension which would force white America to face up to the injustice of segregation and discrimination, that the repression of authorities using police dogs, fire hoses, and truncheons against nonviolent protesters would make visible the injustice that was already there and that the sense of normalcy would no longer be possible. This is what you are facing here in Israel today. For there to be peace and justice in Israel and Palestine, I believe a large-scale nonviolent campaign of resistance is necessary. King and the others realized that such resistance had to be nonviolent. Violent resistance by Af the African American minority would alienate white allies, justify brutal repression, and make victory impossible. What emerged was what observers at the time referred to as the new Negro, challenging both the stereotype of African Americans as weak and subservient to their white masters, as well as the stereotype of African Americans as violent savages. Americans were able to see black people as the brave and civilized ones facing up to the brutal repression of Southern authorities. This is why civil resistance needs to be nonviolent. Now, and let's also realize, of course, that the state of Israel has all the advantages when it comes to military force. This is not a land of mountains and jungle uh, that can provide sanctuary for a guerrilla army. The Israeli state has the technology, the weapons, and the will to savagely suppress any use of military force. And they have demonstrated in the wars of Gaza where the casualty ratio is more than 40 to 1, and 70% of the Palestinian casualties were civilian. Even the use of non-lethal force can be counterproductive. Many within Israel and the United States have defended Israeli border guards gunning down scores of Palestinians in Gaza on the grounds that some of the protesters were rolling burning tires and throwing projectiles, despite the fact that these did not actually threaten the lives of Israeli soldiers. Similarly, many in Israel and the United States defended the killing of the 10 crewmen in the humanitarian aid flotilla back in 2010, even though legally crewmen have the right to defend their ship if boarded in the high seas, and five of those killed were not resisting the Israeli raid. The news media will always depict a movement which uses mixed tactics as its most violent component, <laughs> even if the violent component consists of only a handful of individuals among many thousands <laughs> of protesters. As a result, nonviolent discipline is critically important. And once again, I'm not making moral judgments here. <laughs> I'm saying this as a strategic analysis, a strategic analyst who has a sense of what works and what doesn't. And nonviolence is particularly important in the case of Israel. The history of terrorism against Israelis, as well as the history of pogroms, genocide, and violence inflicted upon Jews over the centuries, makes Israelis the last people who could respond rationally and consider the need for compromise or compassion in the face of violence. There are many hundreds of nonviolent tactics that can be utilized. They could be as simple as replacing road signs or neatly pasting on existing road signs the, the Arabic names for Arab villages in place of the phonetic Hebrew and Arabic script, which is currently the norm. They could include defensive actions, such as Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs blocking bulldozers, tearing down Palestinian homes, or preparing the ground for new illegal settlements or extension of the separation barrier inside the West Bank. It could include efforts to retake confiscated West Bank land by having large numbers of Israelis and Palestinians march in and set up tents. It could include blocking Jewish-only highways connecting Israeli settlements with Israel 
It could include increasing the numbers of Israel, Israelis recognizing Yesh Gavul and refusing to serve in the occupied territory. It could mean endorsing campaigns, BDS campaigns, at least in regard to the occupation, the settlements, and other Israeli institutions which violate human rights and international law. And it can include strengthening the building of more alternative institutions, such as Wad al-Salam Neve Shalom, which challenges the existing order by showing what a future just and equitable society might look like. Now, not everybody will agree with some of these tactics, and certainly not everyone would be willing to take part, but this is just a sampling of the variety of tactics that fall under strategic nonviolent action. And, and, and let me uh, give one more campaign before I, idea before closing. I would consider targeting the United States, given the critical role that Washington has taken, particularly under the current administration, but in many ways previous administrations as well, in supporting the Israeli government in its occupation and colonization of Palestinian lands and the attacks on civilian neighborhoods and failing to be an honest broker in the peace process. Um, one of the biggest myths is that U.S. policy is pro-Israel. It's certainly not pro-Palestinian, but supporting the, the agenda of Likud and other right-wing parties threatens Israelis' long-term interests as well. I would strongly encourage joint Israeli-Palestinian protests at the U.S. Embassy and whenever American officials come to visit to make clear, to get the message out that the United States is not an honest broker, that the U.S. is doing great harm to both Israelis and Palestinians, and that U.S. policy must change to support the, the forces of peace, justice, and reconciliation, not the forces of occupation and collaboration. The American people need to see that both Palestinians and Israelis recognize that you are doing no favors by supporting Netanyahu and the settlers. And finally, the movements must be more inclusive and more willing to set aside political differences on some issues in order to work together where you can agree. The nonviolent resistance campaign must include both Islamist and secular Palestinians, progressive Zionist, post-Zionist, and anti-Zionist, Palestinians within Israel and the occupied territories. And there must be an active effort to include more Mitzrazi Jews. Fin uh, so, Finally, as discouraging as the current situation may be, I am actually optimistic about the power of strategic nonviolent action to bring peace, justice, and reconciliation for Israelis and Palestinians, simply because the status quo is untenable and it's the only thing that can. We have seen how the power of nonviolent civil resistance has brought down communist regimes, military strongmen, monarchs, colonial rule, and other, uh, other autocracies from the poorest nations of Africa to the relatively affluent countries of Eastern Europe. The people of Israel and Palestine have seen how violence does not work, how it has provided neither security and global acceptance for Israelis, nor justice and self-determination for Palestinians. So I implore you, do not give up on the possibility that, with a clear vision and good strategic thinking, along with the support of those in the Jewish and Palestinian diasporas and other international allies, a nonviolent movement of both Jews and Arabs can indeed bring about peace, justice, and reconciliation. Yeah. There's Rat Hashem, inshallah.